Shalom, shalom, Hevra. It's a, it's a delight to be here today with Rabbi Arya Clapper, who's Dean of the Center for Modern Torah Leadership, Rosh Beit Midrash, of its summer Beit Midrash program, and a member of the Boston Beitin. He previously served as Orthodox Advisor and Associate Director for Education at the Harvard Hillel, as Talmud Curriculum Chair at Maimonides High School, and as Instructor of Rabbinics and Medical Ethics at the Gan Academy. Uh, you can learn more about uh, his work and tap into the weekly Torah essays at TorahLeadership.org and the CMTL Facebook page, the Center for Modern Torah Leadership Facebook page. As a student of Rabbi Clapper for a long time now, uh, it's an honor and delight to have time to talk with you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rosh Hashanah. Very glad, glad for the excuse. Thank you. Uh, it's been a long time, I think. About a decade. Um, wow. Uh, well, two decades more intensely, but uh, yeah. okay. So, ju so jumping right in here, we're, you know, this wasn't the uh, original plan, but I think we live in uh, extraordinary times. And, um, and, and the first thing I'd love to hear your reflections on, we would, is how will our notions of pikuach nefesh, of saving life, and of the concept of rodef, of a pursuer, be reinterpreted as an impetus towards halakhic change in the wake of this coronavirus? Okay, thank you. So I want to talk about Rodef first, because that, well, that's a topic that matters a great deal to me. Rodef uh, means um, the idea that halakha allows uh, preemptive action against, uh, to, save, to save your own life or someone else's life against a threat, even if the, the preemptive action involves killing the other person. Uh, now, this is you know, a valuable principle in halakha, but it's also one that is very dangerous. And the way in which we saw it um, you know, used most dangerously is that it was rhetoric used about Prime Minister Abe. Um, that uh, may have been part of, uh, may have in some way contributed to the assassination. So I have, I have to say, publicly been engaged since there have been assassination in attempting to prevent the use of the category Rodef, um, except in the narrowest of circumstances. So here's, and I think that it's very important to figure out, you know, halakha always functions in a legal context and functions in a rhetorical context. We have to be very clear uh, about when it becomes dangerous to use legal rhetoric in a rhetorical context. So here's, for example, I think it's very, very wrong for somebody who doesn't know whether they're infected um, to go out in a situation where they might be a vector of transmission uh, to somebody else. I think that the notion that you could therefore shoot the person is profoundly dangerous, right? They're raising someone else's statistical risk. Raising someone else's statistical risk is a very, very bad thing, but it's not Rodave. So I think, or I want to be very, very careful. I have seen people online, I have seen rabbis online, talk, you know, using that kind of rhetoric about people who keep shuls open, about people, right, you know, who don't keep social distancing in all sorts of contexts. I think those are wrong. I think it's wonderful the way the halakha community as a whole has come together basically with unanimity to you know, take radical halakhic moves, right? To ban, ban going to minion on issue, um, issues like that. But I don't think it's helped by using the, the, the language of Rodef. And my hope is that we use this because we see the dangers, right? If we start expanding the category of Rodef you know, to raising statistical risk, well, that happens in politics also, right? Certain political you know, you're certainly A reasonable person can believe that the adoption of certain policies by a political figure raise the, the statistical risk of death for people. So on the issue of Rodef, I'm hoping this is an impetus to remove it from rhetorical context and return it to the, uh, to the legal context as much as possible. So your pursuit here is, is very noble and admirable and, and that we don't want chaos and violence and the things that emerge from um, categorizing people's rodef unnecessarily uh, or maximally. But I wonder like, what is one category below that? Like, what is the category of those who are unnecessarily putting others at risk? And what is the proper response that certainly is short of Rodave, but something that is a moral imperative to speak out against? Right, so that's a great question. I wanna, I wanna answer that by putting it in the context of your other question about pikuach nefesh. Uh, so pikuach nefesh is, a, uh, is an old problem in halacha, which is that pikuach nefesh is a nuclear weapon. If you invoke pikuach nefesh, you can do just about anything. And so the question is, Right, if we treat that as a, as a hard switch, right, something is either pikuach nefesh or not, so then you only you have circumstances where you, you know, where you do everything, you suspend all of halakha, and circumstances where it just doesn't matter at all, right, where we say shomer p'tayim Hashem, it's just ordinary. Now, this is not a new problem. Um, the place I like to teach about it is in the context of a response from of Rabbi Ezekiel Landau, the Nota Behuda, about autopsies, where he dealt with a circumstance where it was clear that autopsies um, in 
in a lot of in significant circumstances often contributed to life-saving improvements in medical knowledge. And also a very real sociological circumstance where it was almost impossible to be buried in England because competing medical schools because of the new rage for, right, for dissection and the absence of refrigeration. So basically everybody in England got dug up and if he had allowed Jews to be autopsy subjects, then no Jew in England would ever have been buried. So he tried to develop a new category um, and he, could, he called the Lilith Fundanu, right? Whether there's a sick person, an immediate patient needing your concern. And therefore he tried to say, you know, and he said, if I don't, if I don't draw this line, then A, everybody's, everybody's going to be autopsy. There's no, burial will disappear. And he made another argument that was adapted from the Chassam Sofer that says, if I say that Pikoch Nefesh for statistical improvement is really Pikoch Nefesh, so then nobody in the medical industry will ever have Shabbos. We already have a situation in America where doctors don't have Shabbos, but cancer researchers won't have Shabbos, right? Workers in pharmaceutical factories won't have Shabbos because every time you go to work, right? You know, every moment you're at work improves it. So the problem we have in general, Halakha, uh, tried to come up with a standard. This is Pikoach Nefesh, this isn't. With a, and he said it as a bright line standard. If it's Pikoach Nefesh, you can violate everything. If it's not Pikoach Nefesh, you can't even violate Durabanans. You can't even violate rabbinic law. His distinction failed over time because of instantaneous communication. So you can't really distinguish between statistical risks and the risk to an immediate patient because somewhere in the world, there's always an immediate patient. And we've been struggling for 100 years to try and replace that distinction. Uh, I want to give an analogy. Now, the analogy I give in American law is um, beyond a reasonable doubt. So beyond a reasonable doubt is a black and white standard. All criminal cases, basically, the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. But no reasonable person would think that reasonable doubt in a traffic court case is the same as reasonable doubt in a capital trial. Even though the words are exactly the same, there is no legal warrant for applying the terms beyond reasonable doubt differently in capital cases than there is in traffic court cases. But every sane person knows that, you know, that, that there's a situation where you would say, oh yeah, that's beyond a reasonable doubt in a traffic case, and you won't say that in a, right? So we need, I think, halakhically to come up with something resembling what I would call you know, a sliding scale standard of pikuach nefesh, and we need to apply that to rodef as well. Um, but halacha hasn't right now developed in that way. And, there, you know, you understand why there, people prefer bright line standards in the same way that formerly American law about reasonable doubt hasn't developed that way. There are ways we could talk about it. We could talk about the difference between um, failing to save somebody, uh, right, with lo tamuro dam reyecha, and actively, and, right, and actively killing somebody. And it might be that raising the statistical likelihood by some kind of indirect means would be framed as failing to save, right, failing to save somebody. As, right, there, there are ways in which I could, con which I could construct it. Uh, but um, I'm frank that right now, I don't believe we have the right language. I want to say one more thing. Uh, Rabbi uh, Moshe Tendler has a very important article in a, in a book called Kvot Harav, which had a deep influence on me many years ago, in which he said that we have to be very careful about extending halachic language for individuals to communities. Individual halakha, he thinks, doesn't take into account abstract statistical people. If there's somebody drowning in front of me, I can't think if I save that person, in 20 years there's a likelihood, there's a 15% likelihood that 10 more people will die for whatever, whatever reason. That's irrelevant. As an individual, I have to deal with this parallel to the Noda Behuda's idea, right? To Rabbi Lando's idea that I have to, you know, the person in front of me for individual is really a is really the thing that matters most to me. But as a community, I'm entitled to say that I'm going to put my resources towards saving the lives of children who aren't even born yet, 20 years from now. I'm going to put my resources into, into, right, into something that will, that will diminish infant mortality 20 years from now, even if that means that I'm taking the, the, the choices, the money's going to come away, going to come you know, away from having you know, better care in ICUs now. So this, we have to be very careful about taking the language of halakha, which is largely built for individuals, and applying it and, and extending it easily to communal contexts. You know, um, I don't know if it's relevant, but it's been 10 years since I saw this rev motion inside around secondhand smoking. And if I recall, the Gemara was around, you know, a bird who brings a cherry from a cherry tree to the other yard and who, which owner, which property owner is, is responsible there. And, um, and I, certainly no one would act violently or almost no one would act violently today towards someone who was smoking publicly. 
uh, even though we're aware of the dangers of all. But, but you know, about five, 10 years ago, you wrote something up in more normal times around whether we have an obligation to buy a Prius or the like. And you were calculating how much of a sac sacrifice do I need to make individually for the collective good? Um, do I, you recall that? I don't actually remember it, so thank you. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you did a whole mathematical calculation on the expense one would have uh, to, buy a, to buy an electric car as opposed to a, normal, a gas car and whether that was, that was mandated or not. And, and I wonder today in a similar calculation, if someone needs the wages to take care of their family, they need to go to work and while putting others at risk, they're told stay home, stay home, but they put others at risk by going out. Um, does Halak have something to say about such a case of care, you know, f financial need of oneself and one's family versus collective concern of minimizing spread of virus? And how would we, how would we navigate a tension like that? So my, my instinct is um, that Halakha doesn't have so much to say to individuals about that. It pro you know, what it would probably say is that within the boundary set by the society, individuals are entitled to prioritize their own, and their, their, their own family's needs, but they should consider the, you know, the morals, right? How much of this is a need? It, you know, it could be that's the kind of issue that we would say you should ask of Shaila, depending on the kind of person you are, but that the community has the right to say that you're not allowed to do that. And once the community makes that decision, right, to some extent, this is a, you know, a, a, a sort of um, a prisoner's, prisoner's dilemma or tragedy of the commons type issue, right? So we all know, I don't remember the article about the Prius. We all know, right, that if you buy a Prius, right, and the rest of us all buy gas guzzlers, right, that has no impact at all. It's only meaningful to buy a Prius if enough of us buy a Prius is to make a difference. So to say that you have to buy a Prius as an individual is very hard. But to say that as, a, that as a society, we need to mandate a shift to electric cars, that's a perfectly legitimate choice. And once we make that decision as a society, I think that's binding on everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so moving to a question of, um, of universalism. S since this virus doesn't discriminate, obviously, between people of different races, ethnicities, creeds, will its occurrence have any implications on our halachic distinctions between jews and non-jews how we think of just the value of life in general our interconnectivity we always knew that the boundaries in post-modernity so to speak are falling down of, of differences uh, and halacha to some extent tries to keep up some of those boundaries but how in an era where the very air we breathe the very substances we touch and our interconnectivity being so clear how does this impact how we think about torah and halacha Right, so that's a great way of phrasing the question. It's much better than the, uh, than the original. Um, so here's, here's what I think. Uh, I think that, um, I'll put that this, is a, this is a discussion other people have been having about how we deal with, you know, the question people are raising, like what's, are we a society in which life is the supreme value, right? At what point does this stop being, this stop being worth it? So what I think is as follows. First of all, we should always have thought of ourselves as part of the whole human community. And we should always have had concern for the whole human community. You know, and I prioritize those parts of the tradition. When there's a machloket, I adopt the, I adopt the interpretations of tradition that are most consistent um, with, with that type of approach. Um, what I think, has, I think has really interestingly happened and that it offers me a, a lot of hope for the future is a realization that whereas before we might have thought we're making decisions for ourselves and we didn't really think about and, and Realistically, because scientifically, the way we lived, we lived in discrete communities, and knowledge wasn't as great. So you could, right? You could think that we were, we are making decisions for ourselves, right? So you might think we're going to minion that improves our risk, that right, that that you know that that damages us, or we're going to go counsel, right? You know, I think that's where Catholic, you know, Catholic say we're going to go counsel the dead, and that makes that matters for us. Now all of a sudden, we have a realization that this matters to the whole world, and we have is I think. Uh, an enormously positive thing, which is that we're making crucial halakhic sacrifices on the grounds that, um, that that has impact on the world around us. And we're making sacrifices. And here's the thing. Even if we might think that it would be worth a risk to ourselves to maintain the quality of our religious life, right? And I think that's, you know, that it might, I might say, you know what? To, in order to maintain Kriyas Torah B'Tzibur, it's worth having a 1% greater chance of, right, you know, of, of death over a 10-year period, whatever it may be. But now I'm making that choice for other people who won't benefit from that creator of the right? And so the recognition that 
when I make more, a moral calculus, I can't assume that everybody has the same calculus as I do, but I have to make a decision which respects their autonomy. That to me, I think is, a, um, hmm. is, an, enormous, is an enormous positive step. I'll say one other way of framing this is what's really, I think, very valuable about this is that how much the internal rhetoric of orthodoxy on this has really not talked about anti-Semitism. Right? You could have argued, right? And you know, people have made that argument, and you know, the forward, I think, among other places, you know, is, is you know, is where this issue comes up more than anything else internally in Judaism, right? You know, as opposed to externally, that we have to behave this way uh, because otherwise people. But the truth is that that much of the Orthodox community has been way ahead of the curve, um, right? If you know, there's there was an article in the Washington Post yesterday, I think, or in the Atlantic about how mega churches are staying open. Um, across the country, long after all the Orthodox Minyanim, uh, Orthodox Minyanim closes. And here's the, the move America, I want to say. In America, right? Yeah, in America. Yeah. Right? It's the move I want, right? So the Orthodox community is way ahead of the curve and hasn't done it for reasons of anti-Semitism. That's not what drove Bergen County. What drove Bergen County, and which deserves, the, the rabbit of Bergen County deserves enormous credit, was a feeling this is the wrong thing to do for the entire Teaneck community, Jews and non-Jews alike. So here's what I want to say. There has, there's a principle in halacha that is well-known called mishum eva, that sometimes we relax halacha because, the, um, because we're afraid that the non-Jews will hate us. Um, but some figures, I think especially um, Rav Yudu Unterman, the former Ashkenazi chief rabbi, understand this in a slightly different way. What they say is we should not behave in such a way that a reasonable person would hate us. Mm-hmm. Right? It's the moral standard, not a, uh, right, not a pragmatic standard. And it seems to me that that kind of realization has been very much expressed in a lot of the, in a lot of the responses um, here. And it's why I think, and I think we really should notice that the vast majority of the Orthodox community, um, with I think, you know, to some credit, the leadership of the, the modern centrist Orthodox community, whatever you want to call it, have been way ahead of the curve and not out of self-interest. And that I think is an enormous positive thing. Yeah, it's, um, uh, that's a fascinating framework. Um, and I think that a lot of articles that come out that show, you know, Haredi massive weddings or the like are really anomalies and people can come to think that's the norm. Um, so I think it's, that's a crucial point. And the concern for those who are not in the room and who have different, uh, different values than we do in the room and how that affects our halachic deliberations. Um, so just the last question for you. Um, there's enough to be anxious about right now. Um, I don't have to list it. I don't have to list it for ourselves, for the world, for, for all around us, um, for our religious lives, smaller concerns, for our loneliness, for those who are shut in for mental illness. Um, but I wonder, do you have any chizik for us right now? Do you, you know, can Torah give us any chizuk in this moment? Is there anything that can give us um, strengthening or inspiration in this moment of despair? Um, well, I hope it's not a moment of despair, right? I think, you know, I think we, we have to be enormously conscious. I think like in all circumstances, you know, the, the, the people are reacting incredibly and it's pretty difficult. I would think probably you relate to this you know, a lot more than I do that the instinct for certain kinds of people is to be heroic in cases like this. But the problem is that here being heroic is a negative, right? There's no, right, you know, you know in, in past times, these, you know, these are where the heroic people who would go visit the contagious people to take care of them, and here we, you know, here that kind of heroism turns into a, right, turns into turns into a disaster. So it's, and, and nonetheless, you know, I think that we can draw inspiration from all the people who are finding ways to reach out to other people and support them. The other thing I would say is, you know, this is one of the moments where um, I think famously, Rabbi Soloveitchik argues that the purpose, you know, the message of the Book of Eov and the and the ties, the purpose of halacha is to make sure that whatever circumstances you're in, your choices are meaningful. And that I think is a very big thing is that, you know, is that if you have a, that having a religious system that is so focused on really, it's focused on community, but it's really focused on making individual choices always meaningful. And so as opposed to saying, no, you have to go to shul or your choices aren't, right? Because the community is the only place where it exists. And you, right. What we say is, no, you make a choice every day to get up, to dive in, to say a hundred brachot, to be kind, right. You have lots of people in your house and you have an obligation to be kind and nice to the people in your house. And every single one of those moments matters every bit as much as if you were playing on a, playing on a broader scale. So I, I think to me, you know, the same way halakha in all the smaller aspects in life is, I think, you know, can help you deal with a particular kind of despair because it, make, you know, it gives you a moment where every choice is meaningful. You know, famously, you know, the idea that the Khazar is convinced to convert because Judaism has bathroom laws. 
Uh, well, guess what? We still have bathrooms and we still have bathroom laws. And so X number of times a day, you know, you get, you get the opportunity to make uh, really meaningful choices. So I hope that that in that way, halacha functions um, to sustain people in the way it always has. Beautiful. And, and, and new opportunities for transformation that we didn't always have access to in, in, our, in our normal states. Um, thank you so much, Rav Clapper. Wishing you continued bracha and aslacha and all of your all of your wonderful work, friends. I hope you'll check out. I hope you'll check out uh, TorahLeadership.org and tap tap more into Rabbi Clapper's work. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.